Welcome. Uh, my name is Luke Nguyen. I am a co-director of the Petro Yatsik program for the uh, study of Ukraine and professor of political science. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, a wonderful new book on the Donbass. Uh, the Donbass has been obviously a central part of both Soviet and post-Soviet Ukrainian history. Um, in the Soviet period, it was known as you know the uh, home of the of Stakhanov in Luhansk. Um, there was also the the birth you know the sort of where Khrushchev um, you know spent his time uh, in you know working in, in the mines. Later, you know, it became um, uh, you know at the late Soviet period, it all then became came into prominence when you had a number of strikes. You know, uh, taking place in 1989 in the, in the area, and then in the early 1990s in the post-Soviet period, you know, strikes that centered in Donbas helped to overthrow uh, Ukraine's first president Leonid Kravchuk. Um, um, in the mid 1990s, it became sort of a center of uh, corruption and mafia type activity, and in fact, I was spent my time there uh, working for the World Bank, and I met with Vladimir Sherban. The governor of uh of, of Donetsk at the time, and I remember we were planning to do a sort of a microfinancing to help out miners, and he uh, said to me, "Well, don't worry about giving the microfinancing money to miners. I I I can deal with it better myself when we can make a profit together, both of us." Uh, <laughs> um, later, it then became, of course, the home base of Yanukovych, is sort of in the center of kind of. The party of regions and sort of autocracy in Ukraine, and uh, then in 2014, it then transformed into sort of a a critical base uh, for Russian aggression. Um, so this is obviously an important region, um, region that you know everyone has an opinion on, and therefore it's it's great that we see this wonderful new book by Katrina Zaremba. Um, she is a Ukrainian scholar, policy analyst, translator, and writer. Uh, her area of expertise is foreign and security policy, as well as civil society studies, with a focus on Ukraine. She's an associate fellow at the New Europe Center in Ukraine, and she also teaches at the Kiev Mahila Academy. The name of the book, if you can maybe show it. Do you have a copy? Are you able to show it? Um, can you yes. Just... Good evening, Gavin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it's called The Rise of Ukraine's Sun. Uh, it's it's really kind of prevents a very different image of of Luhan, Don, Donbass than we've heard in the past, um, and so a kind of very refreshing view of kind of less as a kind of pro-Russian center of pro-Russian activity and more as a sort of she shows the sort of number of kind of pro-Ukrainian pro-European activities. Um, so it's really kind of um, sort of I think will become a. Uh, an essential text for understanding this important region. And I understand that sort of very, right now it's only in Ukrainian, but there are sort of various efforts to translate it both into German and English. Um, so maybe I'll just start off uh, by asking you, you, you sort of talk about in the book about the demonization uh, of the region and the sort of the Soviet myth uh, of, of Donbass. And can you sort of talk, talk, start by talking a little bit about, about, about that myth and then we'll sort of ask you, so why do you think that's wrong? Right. right. Uh, well, look, and thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to talk about my book. It's my big pleasure and privilege. And uh, you've done a very, uh, I would say, precise portrait of Donbass um, in uh, the popular imagination, the public imagination. Um, so I would uh, completely subscribe to that. That said, it is exactly these images uh, which I tried to counterweight with my book. So it's not that they are wrong, it's not that they are non-existent, they are of course existent. Yeah. But this is uh, pretty much what I would say um, an average person, not, not a researcher, would know about the region in Ukraine and outside. And I wanted to tell an alternative story of the region. Um, you asked me about the myth of Donbass. Um, this is uh, yeah, one of the starting points of my book. And uh, this idea of the Donbass as a myth, I borrowed from Alana Stashkina, who is a Ukrainian scholar and historian born and bred in Donbass, in, in, uh, sorry, in, the, in Donetsk. Why Donbass is not exactly a correct term uh, is for the reason that basically Donbass stands for Donetsk Kolbazin, Donbass, it's an abbreviation, uh, stemming from the 
um, second part of, of the 19th century. So it was coined by a Russian engineer, Yegorov Kovalevsky, and then it took it took up as a um, as a concept, as a term, as a name for the region, comprising more or less Donetsk and Lugansk oblasts. Albeit the Kolbazin borders are not coinciding with the administrative life of the oblast, to be precise. Yeah? But so so it was. It started being a collective name for the two oblasts. Uh, now we can say that it took also it, it took on in uh, Ukraine, uh, I would say, in public discourse. So many people call the region Donbass now, albeit it is not um, typed in into the Ukrainian constitution yet, in the composition of Ukraine as per constitution. Um, now we are coming to the myth, and the myth is about a certain image of the region. There are several characteristics which were purposefully portrayed by the Soviet power in the first place and then the post-Soviet local elites in Ukraine as pertaining to the, to the region as its components of its image. And everything that was not among those traits was just left out. So you already mentioned some of these traits, some of these characteristics. Of course, this is heavy industry. First of all, coal, steel factories. This is um, being Russian speaking, maybe pro-Russian in the meaning of the in Soviet times, Soviet citizen, yeah, the, the ideal type of citizen you can have in the Soviet Union, being uh, pro-Russian, independent Ukraine, being um, pro-Russian, uh, Soviet nostalgic citizen maybe with strong local identity, but with a less strong national identity. Um, this story is true to an extent. I will say exactly what I mean by to an extent. When we speak about the coal as the wealth of, of the region, as what it has to offer, what was claimed to be feeding the Soviet Union and then Ukraine, in Ukraine's independence, was in fact partially a myth. Because while the amazing potential, industrial potential of the region was developed by the European colonizers uh, in the late 19th century, which I think not many people know. So people especially were invited by the Russian Empire from Belgium, from uh, Wales, from which John Hughes comes, from uh, France, Germany, and other states. So they were especially invited to start the mining, to apply their engineering capacities, financial resources, and so on and so forth. And then starting from the 40s, at least, the field was degrading. And then in Ukraine, it was heavily subsidized in independent Ukraine, starting from 1991. So when you speak about this industrial potential, yes, it was there. But to which extent was it really potent? Yeah, but to which extent it was powerful? That's another question. Then you also mentioned Alexis Tokhanov. Alexis Tokhanov is, of course, a, a, a character, yeah? it's a, a, a kind of a fictional hero in the popular memory. Why? Because he was supposed to deliver big number of coal in one night, in one shift. This feat, feat in inverted commas, did take place, but it was staged. It was staged specifically to create this myth of heavy, uh, selfless labor. So when we look into this image constructed by the Soviet and post-Soviet powers about the region, we see that they are imperfect, yeah? they are overstretched, to say the least or outright lies. Now, everything else which does not fit into this image, Ukrainian language, uh, Ukrainian identity, modern culture, being pro-European, whatever that means, um, any other profession than a professional of a working class person, so if have industry factory, was there in the region, but we know so little about it. Now, mm -hmm. my job was to tell the stories of those who do not fit into the myth. Great. So we'll definitely uh, talk about that. But before I just want to talk a little bit more about sort of, I mean, why do you think, um, I mean, you, you quote Lenin as saying, you know, without this region, you know, uh, you know, socialism would have been a sort of a, you know, a, a good desire or sort a of, good vision. yeah, um, you know, that it wouldn't have been reality. I mean, what, what, what do you think was behind sort of efforts to sort of promote this? Is this, um, Curious what you think. Like, well, why why was it so important to the Soviet power 
to kind of promote this as a myth? Yeah, because um, because primarily in the late nineteenth uh, and early twentieth century, the region was indeed indeed producing absolutely massive amounts of coal and steel, which was vital for the economy of the Soviet Union. So before the forties, this this held true, and this was the reason why these enterprises were uh, expropriated or nationalized by the Soviet uh, powers after the Bolshevik Revolution. So the European investors were just told. You, know, you can be free, you don't own it anymore, we take it over. Uh, it was important. But then the um, the planned economy and little expertise of the Soviet engineers and technologists and little understanding of how the field should be run and the exha exhaustion of the field, yeah, mines exhaust themselves, uh, this all led to the um, degradation of the industry. Of course, not all of it. I'm talking strictly about the coal, but still it was, the, the picture was better. With some factories, it was also... Well, it either produced some decent uh, products or they could be potentially re, um, you know, re reoriented re towards modern production if it was for market ideas and approaches. With the planned economy, it all went you know, on the decline. So Lenin Le Le probably was right Yeah, back, back in the time when he said this. But okay. as I said, starting from the photos already, the, the story was different in terms of Donbass contribution to the Soviet uh, economy and later to Ukraine's economy in the times of independent Ukraine post 1991. Right. So, I mean, certainly that's much earlier than most people kind of imagine. You know, the 40s is pretty, pretty early in the, in the, in the sort of Soviet trajectory. Um, so, can you just talk about, you know, begin to talk about sort of, uh, you know, you know, in what ways is this myth um, kind of incorrect? So, uh, yeah, um, I think I started answering it here. Yeah? So we, um, this story, for example, of the Ukrainian uh, dissidents, um, like, for example, Ivan Svetlichny, Oleg Satyhi, Vasil Stus, it's very firmly bound with the history of the region. But these are exactly the people who were oppressed as much as possible by the Soviet uh, powers, and this is just just one example of, of how we just do not know about them, or these people knew very little about them during the Soviet times. For example, Alexa he was um, uh, in, uh, incarcerated, so so captured, took in prison, and an operation was performed on him, so that he dies in the end and not uh, lives um, not lives on. Um, the story of Asilstus, of course, is I think the absolutely Absolutely, well, fascinating in the bad meaning, of course, but I mean, Vasil Stus was killed in prison in 1985, so six years before Ukraine became independent. So this tells us how actually modern, how to the very last years and days of the Soviet empire, it still worked as an oppression, repression mechanism uh, on any uh, free um, and pro-Ukrainian patriotic thought. Um, so um, maybe, sorry, maybe just I mean, I'm, many of our um, you know watchers may not know the story of Stus. Can you just briefly sort of recount um, recount this to sort of remind everybody? Yeah, yeah, it? yeah. Of course. So, so Vasistus was a um, a poet and a teacher of Ukrainian uh, who worked in Donetsk and. Um, his fate was also um, bound with, not only with Donetsk, but with Kiev, and he was actually born in, in Vinnytsia. But then he spent most of his time in Donetsk, and he was so uh, uh, he was so outspoken in, in, in terms of his criticism of the regime and of, in his poetry that he was um, he couldn't find decent job. So this was a typical way of how a person was oppressed in the, in the Soviet system. And then he was in prison several times, spent time in the uh, uh, Russian uh, in the Soviet camps, uh, um, with being after the, I think it was I'm not mistaken, his third term in in, in the camp, uh, when he was uh, under mysterious circumstances killed. Or yeah. I mean, there is still little little known about that incident, so we do not know exactly. The investigation has not been unfortunately over. And uh, however, uh, what we do know is that uh, his a uh, defender uh, in court was Viktor Medvedchuk, an absolutely publicly known, very famous figure in the Russian and Ukrainian politics. Um, 
Basistus rejected the uh, defense. He said that he would defend himself on his own, um, but the uh, authorities still appointed one for him, and uh, uh, the defense actually asked for more years in prison than the judge. So, so, um, so yeah, this is just one of the stories of the Ukrainian dissidents, which is closely connected to the region. Um, and this is not on accident that uh, the dissenting voices come from this region because it was so um, it was so intense in terms of human rights abuse generally and Ukrainian identity oppression in particular. Interesting. I mean, I think definitely, you know, most people, when you think of Ukrainian dissidents, would not think of Donetsk as the source of one of the major Ukrainian dissidents. So that's a really important story to remind people of. Um, um, well, I'm going to go a little bit chronologically. Can you sort of um, talk about sort of uh, the role of, I mean, um, of you know the 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 region in terms of um, you know in Ukraine's independence? I mean, you mentioned um, you know the support in the referendum and stuff. I mean, I think many people sort of you know kind of associate you know when they think of the region, they think of sort of east-west divide and stuff. I mean, what sort of role? Did they play in, in Ukrainian independence, or were they opposed? Yeah, absolutely. So my probably, if if I want to sum up my argument, the argument of my book in one sentence would be the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. And as you see, I, I tried to meet terms and buzz because I mean, one, once you get into it as a researcher, once you deconstruct it, it doesn't fit anymore, yeah, right. because you know what it stands for. Yeah? So the Nation and Luhansk are longer, but if this is cor correct, more correct, then I I, I do use them. So uh, the upper trade is kind of anti-Ukrainian. Um, yeah, by propaganda, they upper trade is secessionist regions. No, this is just a lie because in the Ukrainian uh, referendum for independence, both regions with over 80% of um, vote uh, voted for Ukraine's independence. Um, in fashion, in vain with all the other regions except Crimea, where there was significantly lower uh, support of independence, but still over 50%. Uh, but overall, over 80% of the uh, citizens, uh, residents of Densk and Lugansk regions, uh, oblasts were uh, in favor of Ukraine's independence. And what is also important if we speak about this topic of you know, successionism, which is purely Russian propaganda, uh, is the fact that over the course of Ukraine's independence, there has not been one significant uh, movement political or grassroots for independence of the regions. You know, they were not persecuted, they were not put in prison, they did not go on demonstrations with, you know, slogans or something. It was none. Yeah? So, I mean, if we're speaking about any kind of succession, we should see them traces in some years of these people who would be supportive and who would employ various types of um, you know, uh, political um, uh, protest tools. Um, civil or uncivil, to fight for the city. So no one fought for the idea of Donbass independence ever, you know, that, to make things clear. Right. Um, so, but but we, um, I mean, I just want to sort of unpack a little bit about, I mean, the uh, the vote for independence. I mean, do you agree with Andrew Wilson that, that sort of, um, I mean, clearly the high level of support for independence, uh, you don't want to use the word region, but sort of the parts, <laughs> The, the different parts of that uh, of Ukraine uh, were rooted in sort of different kind of motivation from the sort of support for independence in the West, right? That he sort of argues that it was more about sort of expectations um, that sort of independence would improve the economy. I mean, would you agree with that um, interpretation? I mean, that, you know. Yes, yes, I would agree with that, absolutely. Um, I would say that indeed, I mean, with, with the large numbers of population indeed employed on, in factories and being state dependent or local el local elite dependent yeah, after 1991 um, people would be interested in uh, fixed uh, salaries and decent salaries people would be interested of course in economic stability in guaranteed experts so so forth this is of course partially you know the um or maybe in, in big part this is soviet mentality of, of Kind of having something guaranteed, something provided, and we know that the 80s also for the Soviet economy were not the the, the perfect years. So in the uh, Ukraine's East, it was also felt. Now, um, what we also have to understand uh, that 
um, propaganda and anti-European propaganda, for example, has also been promoted by party of the regions and also local communists uh, during the period preceding a Russian invasion 2014. So when you speak, when you say that you know the, the Donbass, so the region was anti-European, what it, it stands for? It stands for the fact that actually several things. One is that part of the regions would say we cannot trade with Europe, we cannot work with Europe. They would just use us. They would either just close our factories and close our mines, and you would be left without jobs, or they would exploit you. So kind of these two fears would be nourished among the population. Whereas Russia is our stable trading partner, Russia buys our exports, Russia can support us. This is clear, the, the rules of the game are, okay, maybe not clear, but familiar. So there was this kind of various myth um, tied to the idea of the European integration that the local population was fed by the uh, part of the region's propaganda. Um, now, uh, the economic, yeah, the economic issues have been um, constantly and continuously important uh, for the local population, absolutely. And I would say, I would say that this was probably, you know, the um, the entry point or the trump card with which to win the local population, be that uh, the European integration or the pro-Russian Russian cooperation. Right. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, look, on which I would like to mention, yeah, when we speak about economy, I mean, is there any kind of region, okay, I, this is, of course, a bit, maybe a flawed comparison, but still, I mean, is there a region in Ukraine which would not be interested in prosperous economy? Right, of course, but the issue is, like, is whether, I mean, you might support independence for cultural reasons, because, you know, you have always seen yourself as European, and, you know, you want to re re return to Europe, but you also... And this is where, you know, what uh, Andrew Wilson argues, that, you know, you might want to have independence because primarily because of the economic reasons, not because of the cultural reason. I mean, I guess, um, yeah, that's, that's sort of, you know, the, the issue, right? Yeah. Yeah, look, I'm usually, I'm trying to give answers when I'm absolutely sure, yeah, when I'm like, have hard data. Sorry, and just... here, and here we should be cautious. And I put to see a point, I think you're right. I think uh, Andrew Wilson is right. Yeah. But did we ask people for the reasons for voting yes in 1991? Yeah. Right. If we didn't, and if we did not see the, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, how the, this, uh, the, their res responses then would distribute across the country, we cannot argue, why I'm saying this, yeah? I'm saying this because many uh, narratives inside and outside Ukraine point to the kind of very, you know, very peculiar, things about the bus proper. So there people wanted economy and did not, and were not nationalist minority. There people spoke Russian. There was industry, but not only, yeah? I mean, speaking about heavy industry, you also have Dnipro and the Parisia. You speak about Russian language, come on, we have Kharkiv. So what I want to say, it's probably not, not only these regions who want a stable economy, good salaries, and then it's also. Right, right. Absolutely. No, I, I don't mean, I mean, I'm, I'm just to be clear, you know, um, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think, in terms of the your sort of point about separatism is is completely on target. And in fact, I think one of the um, the frustrations I have um, with uh, with you know much of the, the sort of sympathetic journalistic treatment of Ukraine is that they oftentimes refer to both the eastern part as kind of in quotes pro-Russian when it's clear that um, you know that there's never there was never a strong support for uh, separatism at all. I mean, I remember when I was there in the 1990s, um, you know, there was, I never heard anybody talk about sort of joining Russia or anything like that. They were perfectly happy. There you go, there you go. Yeah. Exactly, to sort of be in Ukraine. And I mean, I always thought of, you know, Don, the area as Donetsk as sort of the Texas of Ukraine. And there's sort of this kind of myth of kind of frontier violence and sort of, it sort of had this kind of sense of regional identity, but it was very much regional within Ukraine. And so in that sense, I, I think I could completely buy your argument. Um, Look, and uh, if I may, just one yeah. important addition. When we speak about this 1991 point of reference, and we don't have yeah. any other, yeah? I mean, this is the point of referendum when yeah. it was only one. We speak about it as if we have this, like a person who wrote it in 1909 and is still there. And we have this kind of, you know, absolutely fixed social capital. Great point. This is not the case. We have people who did vote in 1991, and they have now a number of years. And we have uh, a generation to which I also belong, actually, yeah, which, which was yeah. born 
at least starting from the 80s onwards, who either grew up or matured in independent Ukraine. And this made a difference. Now, I do have qualitative data for it, not quantitative. But when you grow up with, you know, independent Ukrainian uh, school curriculum, albeit imperfect, but Ukrainian curriculum, you hear Ukrainian anthem, and you know who Vastus is because he is part of your school yeah. curriculum also, yeah? right. then even if these people spoke Russian and, and the Russian you know, language is another point of discussion, but let's be honest, before 2014 and even before 2022, there were plenty of Ukrainians speaking Russian. Yeah, so these people spoke Russian but identified themselves as Ukrainian or spoke Ukrainian as, and identified themselves as Ukrainian. And it is these people who I actually write about. So I write people who, about people who are overall at the point of today are around the below 40 or slightly over 40. So in their 30s and 40s. And this is already not the people who grew up in Soviet Union and had to make a decision in 1991. This is already you know, new generations coming. And we are speaking about this kind of new history of, of Denis and Lugansk. Okay, and that's a, that's a really um, absolutely important point. And this is, these are, these are dynamics. They don't, they don't, it's like they, they don't get fixed in time. Um, uh, so uh, maybe it's, can you talk about sort of, you sort of emphasize sort of the, the sh actually let's talk about that sort of the, the shifts in, in sort of support for Europe and, and NATO. Can you talk about some of the shifts that have, have occurred um, in the last uh, few decades um, in, in in the region or parts of the? I, mean, I don't want to say the region because you you rightly point out that it's not a region, but it's sort of a shorthand. Um, but you know, um, you know what I mean. So uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, if we talk about uh, again, let let me maybe just go one step back. To my book, uh, uh, to say that I am writing about a minority in the region. Yeah, I'm writing about this pro-Ukrainian, mm, vocally pro-Ukrainian minority. So I think there would be more people who would kind of, you know, tacitly support you know, um, uh, Ukraine as a, as a sovereign state and have this pro-Ukrainian identity. But I'm writing about the people who actually did something visible and active. So this minority was indeed, as, as I think, well, as this is quite common for activism generally. So this was a minority. If we talk about um, uh, if we talk about the population generally, then I do have some actual tables in my book, which I'm opening right now. And I have to say that um, the region over the whole period of Ukraine's independence, as long as service were taken, and before 2014 was absolutely, avidly anti-NATO. Uh, less so about the EU. With the EU, the thing is slightly obviously more tricky because before 2014, uh, the European integration and the pro-Russian integration, so the customs union, uh, if I remember what it was, uh, they were kind of competitive projects. Yeah? I mean, they were discussed in society and in service, they would at various, in various years in time, and depending how you ask the question, do you have the option of combining both or it's just mutually exclusive, you would have fair shares for every union, okay? fair share support. So we have these two different perspectives. Again, um, I have to remind you yeah, about the strong propaganda issue in the region about the EU and NATO. So, for example, I mean, when Viktor Yanukovych came to power and concluded the negotiation cessation agreement, there were no protests in Donetsk and Lugansk. Yeah? So the, the people do say, hey, we did not vote for that. Yeah? It was okay for them. So we have to understand this ambivalence. Yeah? And then we also did another, not we, I, I used the data from the SCORE, uh, which is a um, uh, sociological agency measuring various uh, moods in Ukraine and, and not only in others. So this is an international um, international survey. And they actually demonstrated to me the very much fluctuating dynamics of public opinion being pro-European Union or, I don't know, or uh, even a as late as after 2014, so we're only talking about government-controlled uh, territories, and even being pro-Eurasian economic union, uh, you know, people changing their mind over years. You can see how, how the people, respondents from one group go to, in, into the other group. So what I want to say, the bottom line is, regarding the European or non-European choice, the best word to describe the moods in the Netflix Oblast would be ambivalence. 
And I would also say that if we use, again, the economic kind of card, it would have been, I think, relatively easy to um, uh, make, uh, to persuade persuade the, the, the uh, residents into any direction, to, or both directions, actually. Uh, however, what I do have also to underline, and this is important to me and an important story, which I'm telling in the book, that when we're talking about uh, Euromaidans, as opposed to the Orange Revolution. And we say that you, the Euromaidan were the all Ukrainian protest movements. So there were Maidans all over Ukraine in every oblast. And this holds true also for the Lugansk oblast and even for small cities like Pokrovsk. So not, not just Donetsk, not just Lugansk, not only Mariupol, Mariupol was there also, of course. So there were these people who came out to the streets and protested against the fact that, um, yeah. Uh, uh, so there were no, no people who protested against concluding the Texas Association Agreement, but there were people who protested against the fact that Yanukovych did not sign the agreement. And this is important to know. Interesting. Very important. Um, so now I'm finally going to let you talk about what your, the, the bulk of your book is about. Thank you for your patience. Um, you know, sort of tell, tell us about some of the sort of pro-Ukrainian movements you talked about, sort of, I think, in one in the, um, in, um, the Nets National University um, and others. Can you just sort of describe, you know, some of some of them to us. Yeah, of course, with pleasure. I have to say to the listeners and hopefully the readers of the book that um, uh, it is not an academic uh, work per se. So this is, I would say, hybrid. Yeah, so I have some. Yeah. You know, start out with the academic approach and provide some, you know, academic background, and then I, um, I do storytelling. So um, embedded in the kind of academic research context, I, I do storytelling of various. Uh, yeah characters, various heroes, who are most of them who are our contemporaries and, um, uh, and yeah, still engaged, you know, in, in the various processes uh, in Ukraine now. So I have five and a half chapters, and they are about, as you said, the academic student, student and academic community in Donetsk, in, in particular Donetsk National University. Uh, currently, it's, um, it was moved after some it was moved to Vinnytsia. Uh, then I write about artistic communities, so um, artists and writers, um, uh, film directors who uh, represented this also actually, again, this new generation of the people who saw Donetsk and Lugansk as Ukrainian and European spaces and brought, created this, these spaces in Donetsk and Lugansk already before 2014. Uh, then I have a chapter about the religious communities in which I tried to counter the stereotype, or I'm speaking of myths and stereotypes here, the region as being um, overwhelmingly uh, Russian Orthodox. Um, this is not exactly true. Once you see the, the fabric of believers, you see that there is a, a um, large uh, Protestant uh, minority in the region, and there are also uh, of course, Orthodox, not only Russian patriarchate, but also Ukrainian patriarchate, and there is also um, a Muslim minority, which is interesting uh, in the region. And so, sorry, pertaining to this, um, I speak about the village, the rural area, the preservation of the Ukrainian culture, because, um, yeah, this is one of the, while the cities were urbanized and Russianized, so the, the urbanization and Russification went hand in hand in the Soviet Union and in the Soviet Ukraine. It was not so for the uh, rural area and villages, but it was easier to preserve the Ukrainian culture. So I tell about two of such villages in the Donetsk Oblast, uh, in which this culture is actually purposefully preserved through museum work. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so this is church, this is religion, this is uh, villages, artistic communities, and I write about, yeah, the European legacy and Euro Maidan, so this is this, uh, and I conclude with the stories of the football fans, um, and, you know, and, and uh, ultras of uh, football club Shakhtar, um, another unusual, I would say, finding, uh, because actually football was one of the patriotic driving forces uh, for football fans in the, in the region, so um, I thought this story is also worth telling. Um, and I conclude with some thoughts about the future of the region uh, and yeah. returning of the region under Ukraine's sovereignty. So, okay, so you, can you talk a little bit about this, you know, pick any of your chapters um, 
about sort of you you, you kind of acknowledge that this is a, these are representing minority views, right? Um, but can you you know talk about sort of uh, first of all the kind of the various uh, the reception of you know that 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 the um, that other you know people from the region had kind of in response to these activities like what was was it kind of hostile was it sort of apathetic or what would you say like you know what was the um you know was there kind of you know was there kind of a what was the reaction so, so you're asking about the feedback to the book or yeah no 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 sorry reaction to the actual you know to these these pro-ukrainian activities the sort of uh, you have Poshtovka and um, others, and how, how you know what was the sort of how did the other other members of the university react? How did the how did the the, the, the local community react to this? Did they did they see this as somehow anti-Russian, or did they how did how what was the reception within the population to these sort of pro-Ukrainian activities? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question actually, because you would not see the opposition to these movements except from the local uh, political forces, uh, right. more so from the communists, from what the, you know, the, the participants of those um, uh, events tell me, because this was, as I said before, 2014, I wanted to show that it's not just, you know, the uh, Russian aggression 2014, which kind of revitalized the patriotic uh, thinking uh, in the region, but it was there before. Uh, and yeah, the reaction was good. <laughs> the reaction was, it was not, um, um oppressed or opposed in any way by the population whatsoever right. um so yeah let's um, uh, speak about uh, we, you mentioned post office post office is an interesting story this is a student organization which made many you would think um provocative actions during their uh, active phase so this was roughly 2006 to 2009 the students of um, third fourth fifth course so they but they did they did all kinds of you know national memory preservation um, events uh, in combination with I mean in in addition to various cultural events like doing vertaps so this is Christmas Christmas carol, carol and Christmas performance festivals in uh, uh, Donetsk uh, this is uh, commemoration of Holodomor victims uh, this is commemoration of the Ukrainian insurgents army UPA um, they did these demonstrations in the city center next to popular monuments or in the parks. Uh, for example, during the Holodomor commemoration night, they read out, they read out loud the names of the victims of Holodomor for 33 minutes, and they would not fit into 33 minutes, so many were they. And they would, um, yeah, they would not be in any way uh, opposed yeah, or criticized. At least I have no evidence for that. That said, the Communist Party, local Communist Party, uh, uh, headed by Natalia Vitrenko, yes, they did try to uh, interfere with the events and, and to uh, make them fail and yeah, create some kind of counter events and so on and so forth. So this did occur. Interesting. Uh, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just to conclude this story. Now, when it comes to competition with power, and this yeah. is the story about renaming of the Netsk uh, National University after Vasil Stus, whose story we've just discussed. Uh, now, this was already the point of contention and the apple of discord. And I personally, I could not understand why, as I said, yet Vasil Stus was already part of school curriculum, of my school curriculum. So why would you, I mean, and it was also, uh, he was actually acknowledged as a hero of Ukraine by uh, President Yushchenko. A hero of Ukraine, yes, so it's a presidential level. Why would you oppose so fiercely? And this, and this was where the um, authorities of the university did indeed do fierce opposition to this initiative of the students, which has been there also for, for a number of years. Um, now, why, why so? Um, the explanation which I got, and I think this is plausible, is that this was about losing power because naming and renaming shows whose territory it is. And it was important for the uh, authorities of the university to kind of preserve their version of heroes and, and non-heroes. And for uh, the now, yeah, the, the authorities of the university and also the part of the region, Basistus uh, was the enemy of the people. They thought in, in these categories. Uh, so there, yes, there, there the opposition was fierce. Uh, and uh, the university was only renamed after it was moved to Vinitsa already the, after the start of the Russian aggression. 
Interesting. So yeah, so maybe talk a little bit more about the relationship to the local authorities. Of course, I mean, over time, you had very different dynamics in the period you're talking about, 2006, 2009, the government in Kiev was very supportive of their aims, right? Absolutely, <laughs> so, and that's what they um, tried to use. Yeah, right. And then, but then, of course, after 2010, between 2010 and 2014, they they weren't. And so, can you just talk a little bit more about sort of the local authorities and you know and their sort of shifting attitudes towards these types of activities? Yeah, right. So, well, the ruling elite of the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast has been part of the regions for almost 20 years before 2014. So since late 90s to, I mean, the, the name was different in the late 90s, but uh, it was the same people. Uh, and to, to 2014, uh, the ruling elites were, you know, all, all, the, all the same, the same group, all the same clique of uh, uh, criminals slash politicians. Yeah. Um, what the uh, specifically post, if you talk about post, because there are other stories and other also time wise there are other stories. Um, what post tried to use uh, was indeed this window of opportunity which they saw at the change of the of the president and of the government after the Orange Revolution. So they saw uh, the time the presence of Viktor Yushchenko as a window of opportunity for them to promote the nationalist policy. I mean, if if on the central level it is promoted, then how can it be opposed to the local level? And then indeed, um, I mean, they, they were successful to, to an extent, yeah? I mean, before then the campaign against Vasistus um, uh, renaming uh, started and when students were either um, persecuted uh, or um, persecuted in which way, yeah, for example, um, people would, the, the teacher would address the students and say, okay, you know this organization, you should not be a member of organization, it is, they are villains, they are, so this is not exactly, yeah, the Soviet type persecution in ultimate version, but I would say the start of it. Right. Uh, right. Or they just graduated, and so the, the movement faded away, the university movement, but was preserved as a, as a civic organization. Um, now, there is another story, for example, of uh, which I like very much, um, of the art space, isolation. I think this is, you know, a story worth a novel in itself because this is the um, uh, the story of a factory producing uh, isolation materials, which uh, uh, also degraded and was not any more profitable and had to just stay as a, as a space. What they do with just with such uh, unnecessary uh, for industrial purposes spaces uh, elsewhere in, in the Western world, they convert them into you know, new spaces, for example, art spaces, co-working, so provide, they breathe in new life into, into such uh, objects. And that's what um, a lady stemming from Donetsk um, decided to, to do. Uh, she was the daughter of the former uh, uh, factory, uh, head of the factory, so the director of the factory. Um, and she uh, yeah, decided to convert the, this former factory into an, an art object. She was uh, very successful until 2014, uh, when uh, the isolation uh, art space, museum space was overtaken by the criminals, uh, governed by Russia, supported by Russia, Russians themselves. So we yeah, don't know how, I mean, this hybrid, I'm speaking about this hybrid phase in May, June, 2014. Uh, and uh, the staff of the space realized they cannot work there anymore. They, it's not safe for, for them to be there anymore. And this is exactly the place which Stanislav Asir described in his book uh, in, um, uh, the, uh, in English is translated as um, the torture camp on Paradise Street in which he was detained. So factory turned an art object toward a, a Russian prison. I think this is yeah, something, something completely surreal which only Russia can come up with. Um, but what, the, what, the, what I'm talking about is that this art object started in 2010. Yeah? It was not the Yushchenko time. And it was not actually, strictly, about some kind of, you know, nationalistic patriotic movements. It was about art. But I can see that, I, I, can, I can assume that you can feel this, you know, juxtaposition of a dull gray uh, fabric, yeah, industrial reality, as opposed to colors, literally, yeah, so the artistic works, colorful artistic works, free thinking, um, and liberal mind of bringing people together, you know, to have uh, glue wine for, for the Christmas festival and, and, you know, have some kind of 
poetry readings and, and so on and so forth. So the, the concept of this you know, liberal art was at odds with post-Soviet mentality. And this was also in the position, self, albeit the, the art space team did not think about themselves as a political force in whatsoever way. At that moment, it, it would mean party affiliation for them, but they were a political force because this was democracy and free thinking as against you know, authoritarianism. Interesting. Yeah, they definitely, um, you can imagine against the, the backdrop of these slag heaps that I remember very well. <laughs> In, in Donetsk, and it's like it's a, quite a remarkable image and, and quite a remarkable description. Um, so uh, maybe uh, I just want to ask you about, um, so you mentioned this before, and this came up, um, you know, uh, in your earlier discussion, and as well as during the sort of Yero Maidan, I think a number of people, Olga and Nuk have talked about this, which is the sort of you know, we typically sort of the stereotype has always been that sort of Ukrainian national identity has been in the language, in the Ukrainian language. Um, but I think sort of partly what you're pointing to and partly what other research has pointed to as sort of the uh, kind of Russian language Ukrainian patriotism. Um, I mean, can you talk a little bit about that sort of, you know, what, what um, how, where you see that in, 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 in your study and sort of the sort of Yes, absolutely. So I address it uh, in the introductory part when I just speak about the language distribution overall in the region. There's a very curious figure. So the region was overwhelmingly Ukrainian speaking in the late 19th century and also rural in its population. Um, if I'm not mistaken, over 60% of the population of the region spoke Ukrainian as of uh, the end of 19th century. Um, and, and an overwhelming majority lived in, in villages, so in the rural area. And it turned around by in 100 years. So overwhelming majority lived in, in cities and in towns. So it, it was urbanized, like 90 to 10. And it was Russian speaking, Troy Russian speaking, also 90 to 10. I will not go into the history of Russification of the region because it worked at, differently in, uh, in various points in its history, starting with the which devastated this rural fabric, of course, uh, ending with the uh, mixed population of Russian and Ukrainian speakers, ethnic Russians who came to populate the, the um, region in order to work in the in heavy industry, to the Russian conscious uh, Soviet and, and Russian Russification policy. You know, for what right, so, sorry, um, what I'm actually asking about, I mean, that's, um, is more about sort of kind of Russian language Ukrainian patriotism yeah, yeah, okay. I just wanted to start from... <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. <laughs> from far away. Yeah, good, okay. Uh, yes, uh, again, I think... Um, I think those who... Those in Ukraine, yeah? Th those Ukrainians who, who are listening to us now, they would recognize this pattern, yeah? So uh, being Russian-speaking Ukrainian uh, patriot, this is a phenomenon, again, not only in the East. I mean, in, let's take Kyiv. Yes, Kyiv in the 90s was overwhelming the Russian speaking. Um, and um, an important point maybe for, for those outside Ukraine to know is there has never been a strict division into Russian and Ukrainian speakers, what I mean, in terms of language um, competence. So if people chose to speak most of their day, most of their life in Russian, they would at least understand Ukrainian well, or they could speak it too. So people would be bilingual. Yeah. Um, that's one. Thing. Another thing is, and this is also what what is mentioned by uh, writers coming from from the region, Ukrainian and Russian is a it's they coexisted. Yeah. Uh, the Russian language. Of the speakers of the region would be kind of marked by Ukrainian tendencies, so it would not be Russian Russian. It was already kind of you know a little bit changed Russian, and um, and yeah, um, people would come to the switch at some point, uh, as also it comes to, to people in, in other in other parts of, of Ukraine. Uh, so what I want to say is this language identity is actually blurred. This is my point. Yeah? It's not like, you know, I speak German and then I decide I will speak French from now on. Especially, again, if we're talking about people who were brought up mostly, so exclusively or mostly in independent Ukraine, there would be also this exposure to uh, Ukrainian language, you know, through TVs, through newspapers, not so 
much uh, as in Russian. Absolutely. Again, it is true not only for Donetsk and Lugansk, but there would be this exposure. There would be, um, yeah, literature, Ukrainian literature, at least in terms of school curriculum. Uh, so this is what I think is important in terms of this, you know, yeah, lack of or absence of, of strict language division. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think as, as your work partly shows, you know, the sort of idea that somehow because you speak Russian, you're therefore pro-Russian or pro-Putin, I think is is clearly wrong. Yeah, I mean, this is just so wrong. Yeah. And I think, again, the 2022 show demonstrated, yeah, when Ukraine finally became overwhelming of Ukrainian speaking, I think for the first time in its, uh, yeah, in the history of its independence, Vladimir Kulik tracked these important changes. And uh, and yeah, it's it's also it also holds true for south and the east, less pronounced. I mean, there is some average figures for the whole country, but but this is also true. So let us maybe um, I want to sort of now talk a little bit about um, the war. Uh, you know, the full scale invasion. There's been a war, obviously, going on for a very long time since 2014, but the full scale invasion of 2022. I think many um, observers were including, I have to say, myself, um, even though I kind of feel like I know the region pretty well, um, were, were surprised by the sort of the strength of the domestic resistance um, to the Russian invasion. I mean, these were, many of these figures were people who kind of were members, former members of the Party of Regions and um, um, and the like, and, you know, and sort of, did the, the, the sort of, the strength of the resistance surprise you, and how how do you see you, your work on these pro-Ukrainian communities intersecting with sort of what you know happened uh, during the war itself? Yeah, uh, I think this is the part which I am going to expand a little bit this year um, because I see I, I started seeing some some things which when the draft was already read in publication last year, uh, but I would like to expand on it. So. Um, well, to begin with, uh, the biggest demonstration, I think it's important to mention, that the biggest demonstration in Donetsk during the Euromaidan oh, Euro winter, yeah, the winter revolution of dignity, was in March 2014, in March, yeah, when it was already um, after the dates of Yanukovych fleeing. And in Donetsk, it was the most massive demonstration. Why? Because it was not about association agreement, not about Ustin Yanukovych anymore, it was about Ukraine. It was when people felt that it's important actually evidence for this, you know, pro-Ukraine sentiment of the population at large, because 10,000, uh, sorry, yeah, 10,000 uh, strong demonstration is not exactly a, oh, a minority, a minority of the type I'm writing in the book. So, uh, so yeah, when people felt that something is going on regarding the territorial integrity, they stood up as they did not so much during the Euromaidan. This mattered more than the association agreement and the EU for, let's say, average Donetsk citizen. Uh, and it was when uh, the the blood was also shed, so when the, when an activist was killed, Matro Chernyavsky in, in Donetsk. Uh, so he's considered to be one of the heavenly hundred now. Uh, what happened then? I mean, we well, so the, the part of the region was occupied, as we know, in 2014, part was deoccupied. It is important to, rem to remember that the front line was moving. Yeah, so Slovyansk, for example, was under um, uh, temporary occupation for several months and other Ukrainian cities uh, of, of the region. Now, um, I would say that the resistance of the people from the region um, manifested itself um, to me in several ways. Uh, one is those who went to fight um, in 2014. Um, I know some of them, not all of them, uh, but I do know some, and some like Yuri Motoshak, who found the post of were killed already in 2014. Some of them fought on, became veterans, and went to fight again in 2022. Many people I know, and I actually don't, did not know just the war made me know them, went to fight in 2022. I mean, I'm actually um, preparing a list. I'm going to presentations starting from next week in various Ukrainian cities offline. And I'm preparing a list of those who fell in, who I killed in action from the during the war from 2014 onwards. And the list is long. Why I'm doing this is because, um, yeah, when people say that the Nesko just, you know, let, let their region fall prey to, to Russia, I mean, this is not true. They shed their blood. 
And uh, there are many uh, people also now who fight, and you know, you not necessarily even hear about them because they're more let's say, famous units and less famous but but they are there and they come indeed as uh, this is not my quote but i like it very much for Konstantin Ryutsky, human rights activist also in the army that the, the tractor drivers do fight uh but they're fighting on the ukrainian side yeah so so this this is this this story which to me is, is very moving and i think also little told and this is what i want to have the, the book in the second edition to have um, now, on the other the other front line, I would say the intellectual side, and I know many journalists and intellectuals coming from Donetsk and Lugansk, I mean, really many, this is what struck me actually also before I started working on the book, I'm thinking, come on, there are all these people, um, you know, working in, in, in the media and working as scholars, and they are so many, if they are so many, then something must have brought them up, yeah, they have to grow, grow somewhere, and it could not be a mine, so what were the circumstances in which they were shaped? And that's how I also why I was motivated to research. So th there is this intellectual resistance. There is there are people like uh, Igor Kozlovsky, for example, who was uh, imprisoned with Stanislav Stanislavosev, where uh, imprisoned both of them in Izolatsa and spent several years of their life there. Uh, there are people like Lubana Stashkina, who is uh, not only um, you know, the person who I very much look up to in terms of her intellect and, and writing and her intellectual output, but also as a person who openly admits the dynamics of her personal transformation. Mm -hmm. How you become first maybe a post-Soviet intellectual and then an intellectual independent Ukraine. And her example showed that, yeah, I mean, okay, people change. You think, you, you learn, and, and, and if you apply you know, critical thinking, then you can arrive at various conclusions throughout your professional life. Um, also, as, as, as a citizen, as a civically aware, aware person. Um, and I think that this, this kind of side of, of resistance is extremely important. And the third, um, third dimension, which is extremely hard to measure, but which I know for a fact that is there, is the occupied territories, uh, especially those starting from 2014. Um, it was extremely hard to survive if you had a, a public, you know, public pro-Ukrainian stance, so there were a list of, of the people uh, against whom um, uh, the, so, so the terrorists came after looking in apartments and so on and so forth. So that's why many people left the Vichinous IDPs. That said, there are people loyal to the Ukrainian state in the occupied territories. I do not know how many, but I'm against labeling those who stayed in the occupied territories as, you know, just generally yeah, with one kind of one one measuring stick criminals anti law people i mean there should be trials and there should be courts for those who collaborated and there should be of course everything ukrainian state can give to those who have been supporting the ukrainian state all along and uh, i know that um, youth and then also ma many examples personally young people who graduated in 2016 17 18 in the occupied territories and then went on to, to study in the government controls also in, in Ukraine, which is uh, on the free territory. So this, if, this, if these young people could be, again, if they could be brought up in such thinking, then probably they're not alone. Yeah? So this is just something which I would like to voice. Uh, I think it's important to think about. Absolutely. You know, this, is, this is really important uh, work. And um, you're absolutely right. People face, you know, completely impossible choices in, in these regions. And, you know, um, God. It's hard to even imagine. Um, anyways, thank you so much. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up. This is a wonderful book. It's The the Rise of Ukraine Sun. It's uh, currently uh, in Ukrainian, but it's uh, will be hopefully translated soon. I, um, do you have, is there any, I mean, I assume, do you know where people can buy it? Or in Canada? Um, yeah, it's so far available in Ukraine, unfortunately. So, I mean, the, you, it's sold in Ukraine. But even the uh, Ukrainian uh, version, where can people buy the Ukrainian version? Yeah, it's all over in all big bookstores. So, Kneharna Ye Yakabu, all these online bookstores which work. Okay. Um, yeah, you can purchase them anywhere. And it can also be shipped, of course, abroad. And I am working on, okay. on the English uh, on the English translation. Yeah, but since it's just actually just over one month of uh, active sales. So, okay. I'm... Uh, well, I, encourage I mean, most people, many people who watch speak Ukrainian so they can read a book right away even before the translation comes out. Anyways, thank you so much. 
Uh, it was such a pleasure. This is really such an important topic, and um, we look forward to hearing the new edition, which sounds like it's going to incorporate sort of really important uh, information as well. So uh, thank you. Um, so before I end, I just want to... Um, are you there? I wanted to also sort of shift gears a little bit. I forgot to do this at the beginning, which is, you know, we as the Ukrainian community have asked, many and people have mostly given sort of their support to us, uh, the people who support Ukraine. I also think it's important that we lend our um, support to the, the victims of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, um, because I think it's important. You know, this is a global community and we need to all support each other. And so I forget, Olga, or um, are we able to post the link to, um, to, to for this is for the uh, Canadian Red Cross um, that sort of you can give um, to the, the, the many victims of the, the, the awful catastrophic earthquake in those two part, uh, countries, um, which we're going to post the link. Um, and and the, the government of, of Canada will match donations until February 22nd. So I strongly encourage all of you to give. I've already given a um, $100. Um, if you can also give as well, that would be amazing. I think, you know, we need to sort of um, pull together in these difficult times. So, but anyways, but thank you again, Katrina. Um, it was thank wonderful. You very much. It was a talk. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.